the way my setup is is that my mic is kind of close to the earphones, so it sometimes picks you up after I've been talking, even though we've got gating and shit like that on. And uh, so I sometimes just try and find a way to align you over yourself through my headphones, <laughs> my ed- headphones, earphones, whatever. Earphones. Well, that reminds me, you know, you've had, we've had this on there since the beginning on our Patreon that all of you fans are welcome to come and visit. Goal number one from day one has been buy Ryan a decent mic, right? <laughs> yeah, it's been. We just need a couple of donations. Yeah, I, you know, my worry is that people are going to be like, this sounds fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I've been okay with this the whole time. We don't need to get him on a microphone. <laughs> Fucking Jesus Christ. So there you have it, folks. Harlan's pitch. Hit it out of the park, audience. Oh, and the crowd goes wild. All right, I'm trying to find a way to segue us to, I guess I could just be like, I'm just do introductions or something. What do you think? You're fucking right. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm... Ryan Viva Laventi McKenna. Is that a Starbucks reference? <laughs> Live in large. Live in large McKenna. Oh, it's... I'm Harland an inch an hour grant. <laughs> oh shit. I'm laughing way too much for the topic of this subject or fucking thing tonight. And this is the Doddler's Philosophy Podcast. On the Doddler's Philosophy Podcast Network. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't have a network. we had a network <clears throat> indeed <clears throat> Jeez, that didn't help me i was like trying to clear my what throat. are we talking about tonight ryan <sighs> we i think <laughs> if all goes well are going to talk about socio-political, socio-political revolutions, revolutions. <clears throat> that's right that's right yeah you know, and uh, I guess what I'll say to start us off here is that, you know, we met here in, in Little Beirut, Portland, Oregon, and this you've lived here at least two times in the past. Who knows about the future? And uh, I, of course, continue to live here because where else would I go? I'm not from here, but whatever. I'm not from Oregon either. I'm not even from the West Coast. <clears throat> Anyway, Jesus Christ, Ryan, get together. <clears throat> okay. Could you dawdle a little more about this? Tell me about it. It's okay. We live in PDX, hipster land, neckbeard paradise. And this is a, a place with, you know, protesting is common. You know, it's not an uncommon thing. Even when I first started going to school here, I remember it started to really pick up uh, in the beginning when I first moved here and was going to school. I don't remember it being very protesty before. Um, like when I'd visit, sit, my brother lived here before that. And when I'd visit, it just seemed more, less hipster and more hippie, you know? And it, event, it made the transition somehow. Um, and, Blame Fred Armisen. Yeah. There you go. Well, although that was kind of, yeah, you can blame him if you want, but I think he came after, I don't know when the transition happened, but I stopped smelling the patchouli and I started smelling the clove cigarettes. So, 
but um you know i just remember <laughs> like just trying to catch a bus going to school you know just struggling cuz you know i'd have so many textbooks and they were so heavy like you know biology textbook was just huge and expensive but whatever and uh you know i'd seen like mostly dudes just I almost only want to call them a protest. Sometimes I just want to call them a stunt. And this isn't turning into a thing where I'm like, protest and you fucking liberal cucks suck. You know, it's not like that tonight. But I just remember my impulse when I'd see some dude with his like Izod shirt on and his hat on backwards and his curly locks coming out from it being like, you know, I mean, might as well have been like, Jessica, look at me, Jessica. It's for the cause. You know, like just ask her out, man. Anyway, um, that's kind of how I felt. I never felt like I was, you know, just somebody with some like grab, you know, like uh, repelling skills. Perhaps you, you, <laughs> you could know? maybe call those. Uh, w- would that be a pose tester? Woo-hoo-hoo. For sure. They talk about performative protesting, and I, and and that definitely was somewhat performative. But they'd be you know out in front of city hall or something like stopping traffic. You know, for a, a date, I feel like. I, I don't know. But anyway, it was, you know, youth, you know, young people doing, you know, learning something and being like, I'm mad about it now. I know, it probably gets me into trouble. But what anyway. are a couple of, of examples? What are, you ta- what are they protesting about? Well, that's the thing about protests. Protests can be about just about anything, you know? Um, and there's really not a lot stopping protesting. From like May Day was yesterday, and you know there's a whole bunch of different. It's not uncommon for on like May Day for people to be like you know, you know wanting uh, you know abolish ICE or you know whatever the uh, some kind of workers comp thing or you know I don't know. It, it could be a whole bunch. It of is different. spring. It's a good it's... time to abolish ICE. <laughs> oh God! Shit. Good night, folks. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Oh, I'm trying to make this very serious, Harland. Revolution is on its way. And you're all like, hmm. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what they were protesting. <clears throat> um, I guess it wasn't very effective then. Their signs were just written in pen or something. You're like, are they holding up white paper? I don't know. I'm usually running to catch a bus when I was that. You know, like I was telling you, I was always just like, I don't know, you know? And, uh, you know, I never, rarely would stop and be like, well, what's this stuff all about, guys? You know, uh, the man and the patriarchy and all that shit. Not to say that it isn't about that. We'll get to that later. So, in part, and I don't want to jump ahead and spoil the thesis. <laughs> so maybe I should. But are, is part of what you're saying, a large percentage of protesting in major first world American cities 2019 is more uh, almost a social event for the people doing it than a change agent or an expression of genuine opinion or inform in attempting to inform the public but that rather it's just a thing that we do and we kind of self-identify this way and we meet each other and it's a it's a night on the town is that <laughs> at all what you're saying or what um, maybe there's, there, there is that in what it is that I'm going to be talking about tonight for sure, but it's not all of it. And so I will say, you know, it's close. And I think that definitely applies to a lot of people, but the whole, any kind of particular individual protest and the movement is typically put on, I think a lot of the times by serious people, you know, serious activists with, you know, who are sober and are putting not only themselves and whatnot, but, you know, other people on the line and committing themselves to something that it's probably rather uncomfortable for a lot of people. Because there's there's a lot of introverts out there, you know, it's not like there's just all extroverts and only extroverts are protesters, you know, and there's a lot of people that feel passionately about something, but they don't always necessarily go out there uh, because they're, you know, you know, like to be in crowds. But some of these people are serious enough 
in despite whatever it is that they feel or their personality or whatever will still go out and 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 protest so but i think that there's a lot of that kind of stuff and that's kind of all i was giving you an anecdote about was that it just it happens enough that it's like yeah yeah you know it felt like anyway like i'm trying to get from a to b you know and i made commitments prior and and you know you made commitments to protest and i made commitments to try and get good grades anyway okay so here's a little just to sort of set the stage a little bit here's a little proportional analogy and this is from this one book that i i read um by micah m white uh who was an editor for the magazine adbursters um i was uh co-created by this guy kale something i'm sorry i can't remember his last name and then another guy and these people are about my parents age they're you know in their 70s um at this point and uh the idea of adbusters just real quick was to try and educate young people on kind of how marketers are trying to get their attention and make them buy stuff and whatnot feel bad or good or whatever and this guy micah you know i won't get into his whole backstory at the moment but it was kind of a dream job for him to be an editor. Um, and he and this guy, Kale, would, you know, come up with protest movement ideas. And uh, But in this guy's book, he talks about, uh, this is Micah White, he talks about how protests, in a proportional analogy, you can think of protests kind of are to battles as like sociopolitical movements are to wars. Does that make sense at all? Yep. Sure. Okay. All right. So, and um, essentially the the point of protest isn't always, I guess you could say, revolution, but it just depends on how you look at what the si- what a revolution is supposed to be. Maybe people are protesting and they're picketing their employer because they don't they don't feel like they're getting paid enough or whatever it is. But I guess it's hard to say. You know. We, You want to talk about revolutions and definitions and stuff like that. But to some extent, I think you could consider even just for people picketing or strikers or people striking or whatever, that that it's kind of like a revolution if they get, if they win Um, and um, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, but typically I think the idea of a revolution is just like your overthrow. It's like a power struggle where you overthrow, right? Uh, an authority and, you know, change the system so that, you know, you at least are not powerless, you know, Um, that kind of thing. And I I don't know, uh, won't get much further into that at the moment. Um, Any, any things that are So you're saying we have a sort of, gradient between an individual event protest like these 50 people were in the road in front of portland city hall at this time and you know they yelled these words what that very limited spatio-temporal event analogized to a very large and extended over space and time socio-political movement and then a socio-political movement could potentially foment a political revolution, which is a major battle, right? It is an, a, an event, and it happens, the revolution, right? Uh-huh. But it's a bigger deal. And if they are successful, there is some temporary, drastic alteration in the power structure of a society. Is that a way to characterize it? what yeah. this revolution is. Yeah, I think it's So definitely... these are the the family of concepts you're talking about, and, the, and you're saying they're related and they're kind of differences of degree rather than kind or something. Yeah, I would say differences of degree and scale. I guess that would be, um, especially between the a movement and a protest. But I think you get to possibly a movement before you can can achieve revolution for the most part. Mm-hmm. 
But in general, you know, we're talking about some authority versus the slash some people. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting to me because there's uh, that that guy, Michel Foucault, and I know other, at least French philosophers, also had similar or at least tangential discussions of power and whatnot. And I know Foucault kind of became a well-read individual on that particular subject area when it comes to social, political power and the struggles for it between groups. And it's definitely made its way into the humanities. And um, I think to the today, I think there's quite a bit of the power struggle going on and the idea that you're trying to achieve you know, power. And that's really what it comes down to. It's, it's not as much about maybe justice is there, but I don't know if justice is the only thing that people want because justice is a, a more fleeting thing. Whereas power potentially is something that you wield and hold on to for a while so that injustices do not continue to happen regardless. You know, I can think of like, for instance, the prohibition or something that becoming like a movement and then getting its way into po the political uh, arena. And then we, we prohibit the sale of alcohol, which then maybe people feel like there are these injustices happening because people are not able to handle their alcohol or whatever it is. Um, there's been dry towns and dry counties and so on and so forth in the United States anyway, you know, and you can imagine just being like, okay, well now we've cut down on the, on the number of what we would might perceive to be injustices, you know, drunk drivers or, uh, whatever people abusing each other at the, you know, because they're not themselves or whatever, you know, as long as we have that, then we've got this power and we're limiting that. So I kind of think power is this bigger umbrella thing that people are after, and so, yeah, I kind of, I don't know if I, it's, it, power is kind of sneaky. I guess that's the other thing about it. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out if I want to read from Foucault or not. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to. <laughs> so I'd have to be like convinced. What a tease. All right. Should I? All right. Well, you can't even bring it. We, I mean, you'll raise the brow of this show by a, at least 5%. Okay, well, this um, is this book that it has a number of, it, its chapters are all just basically like interviews, if you will, between Chomsky and Foucault. And it was the Chomsky and Foucault debate in 1971, I believe, in Belgium. And um, this anarchist philosopher guy, you know, he put it on or whatever. And you probably see lots of it in, uh, you know, on YouTube or whatever. And so this is sort of a, a question that was asked by this guy, Elders. I can't remember his first name. I don't, I mean, it's up there somewhere. <laughs> anyway, it says, Do you believe, Mr. Foucault, that what we can call our society is in any way democratic after listening to Mr. Chomsky talk about injustice? Later on down the line, because Foucault was not an, a, a brief kind of talker. <laughs> not that the forum was like that anyway. But he kind of says this. He says, eventually he says, I believe that political power also exercises itself through the mediation of a certain number of institutions, which look as if they have nothing in common with the political power and as if they are independent of it, while they are not. One knows this in relation to the family. And one knows that the university, and in a general way, all teaching systems, which appear simply to disseminate knowledge, are made to maintain a certain social class in power, and to exclude the instruments of power of another social class. Institutions of knowledge, of foresight and care, such as medicine, also help to support the political power. It's also obvious even to the point of scandal in certain cases related to psychiatry. And so he's kind of really one of those individuals back then, I would say at least for the United States was sort of, you know, we were, things were still kind of good, although they were starting to come down. And obviously there was a bunch of movements that were taking place throughout the sixties, fifties uh, and into the sixties. And of course you got the hippie movement and all that. 
but still like things weren't terrible uh in 1971 the way they you know are now by comparison uh in with respect to uh the way people are are feeling about their position in the world and there's a lot more obviously strife and people are very angsty and angry and everybody's kind of reacting and and all that um but i kind of think that that's sort of just one little thing to talk about i'm going to revisit that because what i think he's basically talking about is what i think is known in historian uh, literature as the patriciate which is the the elites the you know the the patriarchy <laughs> you know and that's going to play in a little bit more but i just want to want to talk about that a little bit because i think revolutions are essentially an attempt to overthrow that and to break the shackles of all the institutions through which the patriarchy, if you will, or the patriciate has kind of come to dominate and control. So we're stressing here, question mark, the dynamic of the sort of power that a state exercises over its individual citizens as an, a type of power dynamic, yep. and then expanding that out to to point out that imbalance exists even in places where it is not obvious or surface that it's there right you might not think if you visit your kindergartner's public school classroom that there is any obvious or relevant exercises of a the state imposing power over its subjects here we're just learning how to read and tell blue from orange but Foucault and others think that in many insidious ways that power imbalance and power dynamic and is being exercised in more places than you might suspect is that kind of Yes. The message. Yeah, and there mm -hmm. are, at least at this point in time, maybe back in 1971, it wasn't as readily available, the information, but at this point it seems to be more available, that there are very specific, explicit <clears throat> ways in which this is done. So looking back, you go, oh, that's how that was being carried about, carrying, carried out or whatever. And hopefully I get to that, but I want to keep moving because I'm trying to... Set it up without jumping well, yeah. the gun, you know. Okay. Well, real quick, just to throw in this tidbit for anyone who doesn't know or remember, that that was what Foucault's masterpiece, if not first book that kind of made his name, The History of Madness, where he mm -hmm. was arguing that what various societies label insanity is another one of these, well, yeah, you think, you might think, or they might try to tell you, no, this is just a diagnosable medical condition. There's nothing political about this, about insanity. But he thinks in many ways there is, right? There's a political dimension, if not the primary. Yeah, well, I think it's the elites with control over not just political domain, but also with, within various other sectors of society. And and it I mean it's pretty explicit when when historians go back and they piece things together they go oh okay here's what they're saying and here's the changes that actually occur in these institutions when the president comes out and has this big talk at the whatever you know that kind of thing you you can piece it together and just go oh that's the that's when things changed and when I was talking to you guys, to you earlier and other pod you know podcast episodes like hustling past the graveyard and stuff these are the cycles. And these are things that happen at various times in the cycle, in the secular cycles. But that's just the top-down component. The elite overproduction, the elite fragmentation, then the closing of the patriciate. Those are these moves that happen. They happen in all these different periods in history, too. So it's not just, like, recent. You know, the phrase, the closing of the patriciate, has to do with after the Roman uh civil wars that's the, where the phrase actually comes from so these things at least go back to the you know first century bc if not earlier in you know large organized human societies 
So it's not some, so that's the other component. And I'm going to also put this, set this in a framework in just a bit. But I did want to just quickly talk about what are protests and how do sometimes they lead to revolutions or not. And I just kind of want to quickly talk about two, and I'm going to do it off my memory. So I'm not going to be able to, so this is just going to be Ryan talking. So as I understand the events that unfolded that led to the Arab Spring in 2010 and 2011, it really wasn't, these events can sometimes be really sensitive. You know, the the way that they tip one way or the other, or not tip at all, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of perhaps somewhat like, um, you know, the like an action potential firing between two neurons, you know. Uh, it just has to build up to a certain point, and then bang, it fires. You know, it's that kind of, it you know, requires a threshold. And what it seems like to me, the thing that set the, the tipping point for the Arab Spring was this man who in Tunisia was, you know, uh, primary support for his family. And he went out with a fruit cart to sell fruit and just sell his wares on the street to make money for his family. And at the time, the, you know, the, the, the government and those in power used essentially intimidation, humiliation, whatnot, to keep people in line. And this woman, who was a cop, went up to him and she uh, essentially harassed him and, uh, you know, just kind of shamed him and all that kind of stuff and then took away his cart. Well, because these people have been intimidated all their lives and because the, the, it, the life is super fucking bleak, it's not hard to see where this guy feels like everything's just been taken away from him for nothing, you know, just to keep us in line. It's, you know, it's an exercise of power that's gone too far. He went to go to the, you know, municipality or whatever that he could make a complaint to. And they pretty much just shrugged their shoulders, more or less. I don't know all the details. I can't remember anyway or at this very second. But they didn't help him. And so what his decision was, was to then douse himself in gasoline and scream, how am I supposed to make a living and light himself on fire? And it's called self-immolation. And... The power, people in power tried to make it so, you know, they could, you know, seem sympathetic and all that. The president eventually went and because the guy lived through this horrible event and, um, you know, he's in bed. There's like pictures of him completely covered his entire body, except for like a breathing and feeding apparatus or whatever. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I don't know how anyone could continue on living or, you know, why he didn't die or how they anyway, but. Even the president tried to show up and be like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm so sorry or whatever, <laughs> you know, that your life is like this. But clearly that's an admission to the fact that the guy, that the system's broken. Anyway, then they asked the family not to go across by the municipal buildings or whatever, just go around this back way. People, of course, had phones and they started to film hundreds of people who were now learning about this episode and people started to you know, gather up and before you know it, they started to protest and, and, uh, you know, it eventually the guy stepped down, I believe the president or whatever, it toppled that particular group in power. And then it started to ignite a lot of these things in other areas of, you know, the Middle East and Northern Africa. And, you know, like, for instance, when it finally arrived in Egypt, they just kept chanting the same thing over and over again in front of the parliament or the president's, you know, um, home base of operations or whatever. And he just <laughs> left Mubarak. He was just like, I can't deal anymore. Like, so there are all these, you know, the Arab Spring, it was a movement, people wanting to transition to democracies. They want to be able to have options and things like that. Well, on the heels of that, um, is where this guy, Micah White and Kale, which I can't remember his last name. I'm so sorry. Anyway, they came up with the idea for Occupy Wall Street and they tried to spread the word through Reddit and, you know, the dark web, deep web, whatever, as well as, you know, just their network of other people who are, you know, I don't want to call them professional activists, but probably many of them were, but many of them may not have been. They spread the word. The idea was that we'll do some kind of march or whatever. 
and we'll settle out in um, Zuccotti Square in you know in front of you know in Wall Street in that area and just camp out. And they started uh, that you know they started to do that and um, they decided not to interact with the media and they the whole idea was they would just have one demand or whatever and everybody kind of organized everybody did all these uh, you know if somebody wanted to make a library they could do it and it was very much just a kind of i'm sorry but it's it read like you know hippie commune stuff where it's like yeah go ahead you know like but there was a sense of camaraderie and everybody was helping each other out and if people walked by and asked questions some of them would even be brought into the you know they were convinced that's a big part of protest and revolution is to convince the people that are you know, around you that to join your cause, you know, and um, just kept on going like that. And I don't think that the, you know, I think uh, Bloomberg was the mayor of, of New York City at the time. I don't think anyone really knew what to do. I don't remember all the different stories, but essentially it started, you know, a movement where people started to occupy this and occupy that, whatever it was that they, you know, the city they lived in, you know, occupy Vancouver, occupy Miami, whatever. And it also started in other countries as well, uh, besides Canada and, and, and North America. And, you know, it ran its course. There was some pretty evil shit that happened at the end um, where, like, they, like, had a blackout of for media. And then they, you know, with helicopters and they turned off all the lights and then they spotlighted the area at the end. And this is after they'd, you know, there had been... Um, you know, a, a march on the Brooklyn Bridge that they shut down and people got hurt. I think no one died, but I don't remember. Other people were just kind of doing what they call a snake march, where they just kind of snake their way through the city in different blocks and stuff, and a cop saw them, and he just maced the person in the face. He was just like, ah, you know, and like, so there was little events like that, but apparently throughout the Occupy movement, people did die. There were beatings uh, where, you know, cops like, you know, beat this one guy and literally broke his knee, you know, like these kinds of things are, you know, obviously going to happen, especially when, you know, you're downtown Portland, Oregon, for instance, and you're an Antifa versus, you know, the the other group, uh, the, the alt-right or Proud Boys or whatever, or the Patriot people or whatever they're called here. But that's just two things. Now, Occupy Wall Street didn't end up turning out a revolution, but it was a success. And it, as the guy says, it tested all their hypotheses and it was, you know, a way to kind of occupy this, this, this space and just keep staying a reminder. It's sort of, I don't know, like a permanent protest or whatever, as permanent as it can be. So that's kind of the, the Occupy thing. And this guy, Micah White, do you have any, uh, I don't want to, I'm going to move on to Micah White and his, his ideas and stuff now, but I don't want to, you know. I don't know if you have on the tip of your tongue, but in what ways would it be considered a success? Would Occupy be considered a success? I guess because they learned quite a bit. As he says, it was a constructive failure. You know, it was like um, they learned that they can... Uh, you know, for one thing, he could pass on an idea and people would just run with it. And then once they ran with it, that they could create essentially sort of like this emergent society or whatever that came out of nowhere and just was ready to go. Um, and people would, uh, people were free to do what they wanted and yet they were quite cohesive as a unit so this, I'm going to get to this later, but the idea of what he was calling horizontalism, but I think it's just flat hierarchy, this notion that people believe in something and then, but no one's in charge and yet still it self-organizes to such an extent that it can function just fine. In the beginning, they tried to get, for instance, people like Michael Moore and whatnot on board, but they didn't really respond much to that there was a uh, particular hip-hop artist i want to his last name is fiasco i think but i can't remember lupe? his first lupe fiasco and he he created the the chant meme you know like all day all week occupy wall street and once they become a success in that way and it became a movement globally you know then people like michael moore and whatnot started to come onto the scene 
And it just showed that they could get the attention of the powers that be when it seems, and this is the whole point of his book, so I guess we'll just transition into that, that protest is not working anymore in the way that we have been doing it. Okay. Well, that, yeah, I want Right. Hopefully this is where you're about to go. Yeah. What I'm sort of... The thought I had based off of what you just said, whether or not I'm just reading too much into it is, Occupy Wall Street was a quote-unquote successful protest, but it was a political failure. If that's the case, then one possible explanation or response to that would be, protest doesn't work anymore. Because it was a successful protest, but it didn't make any change. So that just means that protest doesn't work. Well, I don't okay. know if that's the point. Well, the point yeah. is that it became, it was a protest that became a movement. Just like in the Arab Spring, the protests in Tunisia and the incidents that transpired prior to it, that led up to it, became the Arab Spring, a movement. And then the transitions to democracy started happening all throughout the you know Middle East and Northern Africa. And in the Occupy movement, or the Occupying Wall Street, eventually became a movement as it caught on and people were like, you know, pissed off about whatever. And so I, unfortunately, Occupy could become whatever people wanted. They wanted to have it be one demand, but they weren't specific about what that was. The actual demand was that they didn't like the way government was working today it wasn't it wasn't for the people they didn't like that for instance the uh after the 2007 2008 uh banking collapse that the bankers got off you know like that kind of stuff they wanted people to be held to account and nobody was doing that in politics and so that was essentially i think the wall street thing go to wall street where the bankers were and everything and occupy it and just you know instead of just handcuffing yourself to the chair and the police department and say, I want climate change to turn around or whatever, you know, just go to a place where they're kind of vulnerable and be specific about in a way, a lot of these maybe hidden variables, if you will, that Foucault's kind of talking about in an, ex in a way, not totally. Of course, everybody was familiar with the bankers getting off but just kind of reminding people again it's not like the anti-war movement where it's very clear when your son or daughter is not in the house because they're off fighting a war and you don't know when you're going to get that letter this is one of those things where people can kind of become quite apathetic towards and so they wanted to bring that to the table much more but it became a movement it did not become a revolution he thinks that it had the opportunity it could have but uh, and I don't remember all the reasons as to why it didn't, but it didn't. So that's the problem to him, is that people just protest. They tie themselves up to a lamppost, Jessica, you know, trying to get everybody's, you know, attention or w for whatever the reasons are that they're protesting. And it doesn't work. And in ways, because they don't understand revolution they don't understand what they don't understand the cycles they don't understand any of this stuff and so they just they get pissed off about something they go protest and it's just a blip right and they're doing it every weekend and they're you know and it's it's just become this thing that everybody kind of just goes eh, you know it's there it is again you know it, it it becomes oversaturated so that's kind of i think the idea of, is the problem his book is called the end of protest <laughs> and his whole he has an analogy that I kind of liked, and he's got two animal or yeah I guess you could say animal analogies that I kind of like, and I it, this one's this one's the first one, and the other one will come maybe later. But he's got he's like consider three pigeons that peck at a lever and get food, okay? So pigeon one pecks at a lever, immediately it gets food. Pigeon two pecks twice at the lever, gets food. Pigeon three just pecks and at random food gets doled out to it. All right. So the idea is that with once you've established this, you know, thing where the pigeons peck and they get food in whatever manner they do, stop giving them food altogether. Pigeon one pecks at the lever, doesn't get anything. Pecks again just to make sure nothing stops pecking altogether. Pigeon two pecks twice, nothing. Pecks twice again, nothing. Maybe it pecks twice one, you know, one more time. Okay, then it stops when nothing's coming out. 
Pigeon 3 is pecking away at this lever and not getting anything, but it didn't know when it would get something one way or the other anyway. And so there's this idea that he had that people who are protesting believe that they're every time they protest, they might start a revolution, you know, and that's no way to go about trying to be, a, a, you know, to protest because you're just wasting energy and it's inefficient and, and you could be doing other things that would be more beneficial to society than just every weekend being a, you know, a, a protest warrior or whatever. With a more reliable reward mechanism. Or something. Exactly. And he was saying, you know, he kind of hints at uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He's like, protesters are fooled by randomness when they do hit on a revolution. You know, they don't realize that it, if things just lined up. The other quick little analogy he had was, imagine you have a plank, a four by four, two four by fours on top of each other. And he talks about reality and stuff and whatever. I could say you could just say it's your different varying degrees of understanding of your world or whatever. And you have this immediate understanding of the world and it, you know, and, and this other layer that's harder for you to understand and grasp or whatever. And say you've got holes drilled into the planks and you just kind of move them at random across each other. Every once in a while, the holes will line up and that's when you get a revolution, you know? And so it's that kind of like, how, what is it that's causing, is there something about, is there something underlying it? that we could understand. And then when it's the right time, protest and bang, you get a revolution and get the change you want to the point where, anyway, I won't even. <laughs> so he has this, he has uh, some theory and he has what he calls a unified theory of revolution. And essentially he, he makes the distinction between unified and eternal. He's saying unified. It's just right now. This is what we've got. And this is kind of how I see it. And it's not like this is always going to be the way revolutions are or whatever. So he does that in the beginning. But he essentially does a, it's, this is, I've did this with the, like the, you know, um, game playing, truth seeking, you know, uh, you know, that whole thing. Like it's a, it's a two axes that intersect, you know, remember we were, we have that episode three or whatever. Yep. Try them and enjoy. Anyway. And then uh, you've probably seen, uh, I know you have, maybe some of the listeners have seen, but like there's a, uh, you know, um, where do you fall in the political spectrum kind of thing? And you've got, you know, the X axis, if you will, is a uh, left, right, you know, political axis. And then the the, the Y axis is like, uh, you know, the bottom is libertarianism and the top is authoritarianism or whatever. So he has something like that. So you can picture that. So, but his X axis is between what he calls subjective and objective. And he kind of in parentheses says human and non-human. And then he has an x-axis, which is material at the bottom, and then at the top, he's got spiritual. So subjective is on the left, objective is on the right, material is on the bottom, spiritual is on the top. And then in parentheses for material, he's got natural. And then in parentheses for spiritual, he's got supernatural. So he talks about these four quadrants, if you will, and these are the different ways that people view or can understand revolution. The first one he talks about is voluntarism, which is this idea that if, you know, we all just act into, you know, as individuals coming together and aggregate, we will create change. That's this notion of voluntarism. I'm probably butchering it to some extent because he goes on in much greater detail. So voluntarism is a quadrant between material and subjective. Uh, so it's to the... And is that where Occupy is? Um, I don't know, because he says you can be in all of these at the same time as a particular movement or a protest. You can cover all oh, of these geez. quadrants. I mean, no. So, but voluntarism is just like a perspective. What brings people and what do they think and how does it work and, you know, all that kind of shit. So you said that's the material human. Is that right? Yeah, material, natural human, material, subjective, okay. voluntarism. And then on the other side towards objective, but still material would be structuralism, which is the kind of stuff that I've talked about, the Peter Church and secular cycles kind of stuff, that there are factors at play that are beyond you know, just simply individuals volunteering and coming together and it's going to get done, damn it. And so it's kind of outside of, it's, you know, outside of the individual. 
you know, that these forces, you know, act. The individual just walking around. So is that the either Marx or the Jordan Peterson reading of Marx there? That it's a historical process, it's going to happen, it's not up to any of you, you can't stop it, but it's still in the material, you know, it's about the yeah. the movement of, okay, yeah. Indeed. Then there's what he calls, it's between the human subjective or whatever, and the spiritual, it's subjectivism. And subjectivism is this idea that, he says it's spiritual, but I can totally see it being more just meditative or whatever you know what i mean like it doesn't have to be spiritual like wispy spirits that are supernatural but the idea is that you the revolution the whatever it is it change changes in you 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 change like your perspective on the world and on what you want the world to be an attempt Ooh, to help okay. create it so this is that's like osho or something what's osho uh the bhagwan uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, the that kind of movement where you know we're all going to go live on a commune out in yeah in Oregon or whatever, and we're going to be the change. You know, it's gonna there's going to be a revolution in your mind. Yes. So there's that. This is a big component of this Michael White guy because he talks about mental environmentalism and stuff like that. And he also quotes people with the last name of Rumi or or their only name is Rumi. I don't I, I, I Oh know. yeah, that's that poet that everybody loves now. He's a, he or she, I don't even know, but is a pretty right trendy thing right now. Yeah. And then he calls the one between spiritual and objective is Thurgism. I think that's how you say that. Thurgism. Aw. Uh-huh. What is this? And this is basically just as far as my interpretation is, and I did it. This just isn't my thing, you know? I'm sorry. But basically, it's like when a revolution happens, it's a miracle, you know? It's, you know, these religious, you know, it it, it invites the possibility of the divine and God and all that kind of shit. It's supernatural. Someone helped you along the way. And that these, though, or, are okay. ways that people have looked at revolution you know so they don't all agree with each other some people are more staunchly in one or the other but anyway these are sort of i guess you could almost say these are schools of thought perhaps about revolution i don't know anyway you were going to say something oh i keep i'm just keeping attempting to fill in making a guess about and exemplars of these different quadrants and i'm wondering if this one is a sort of zeitgeist or hegelian thing that it's an ideas revolution it's not what? inside of each of you <laughs> sorry yeah <laughs> okay but that there's the spirit of the times and it's kind of just happening that it's all you could even give it a dickensian reading and be a memeticist about it perhaps but that it's there's a general extra individual social level alteration of the way our the way we tend to think based on something or other. I don't know. Zeitgeist. I like that interpretation. Uh, cultural mood is often talked about. Um, I think that's charitable. <laughs> uh, and I guess that's what you, I'll You'd say. like it to be more nonsensical than that. Like, yeah. Yeah. More I mean, meaningless. Um, we're not, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that I, I just think that he's talking about, it's more God-oriented than I, than I thought it was going to be when I was reading it. And that he says things like scientists and rationalists and materialists, that is, most contemporary activists, will refuse to believe, you know, this magic causes the rain and all that kind of shit. And will say that it's chance or random luck and and that, you know, there's no miraculous divine intercession. And secular ultra-moderns disregard theurgy or theurgy or whatever out of an ideological bias that privileges material secularism. You know, he says things like, and I'm just like, uh, you know, like. <laughs> so you're right. He, he indicates to you rhetorically, if not right, in obvious claims, that he has sympathies with a very particular theistic version of quadrant upper right. I think so. I do. So, yeah. So that's kind of the idea. 
Um, I just kind of, I've been weirded out a little bit by that. Not like I am clutching my pearls. I'm just sort of like, uh, it makes me queasy because then I'm just, all this shit comes flooding back and all the doubt and I've never, I mean, I I just was never religious. I was never spiritual. I was never any of that kind of stuff because I always thought, you know, come on, there's a guy in a red outfit coming down my chimney uh, the 25th of December or 24th or whatever, you know, just whatever. It's one of my favorite arguments. <laughs> Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Miracles happen, Ryan. Okay. Um so there's that. You know, there's that whole that that's just sort of the theory component. And the thing about Occupy is, you know, he kind of thinks that there might have been it might have been a good moment because there is some suggestion. Oh, and he's not unsympathetic to structuralism i think he's actually he he's you know he's it's hard to deny the structuralism stuff which we'll get into in a little bit but um, and that's where foucault is too right probably yeah structuralism yeah Yeah. i would totally imagine this structuralism i'd say most people are i mean if you were to just talk to a scientist you know they'd be like yeah i guess i'll go with that you know anyway when he talks about the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization food price index. And apparently, the food price index, if if it's over 210, which I don't, I mean, it's an index, so whatever, you tend to get riots and social unrest and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, when the Arab, Arab Spring was happening and the Occupy movement and uprisings and all that were going on food price index was at 229.9 you know so it's like yeah okay you know and apparently you know there's a cost of sugar risen quite a bit and you know it's just one of those things and then the prices went down after you know a couple years and it sort of settled out and so i think he was thinking that the moment had passed do you know what i mean so um, it didn't pass for the Arab Spring, but it did pass, like the Occupy never quite fully sank its teeth. So his idea, he's got some ideas for solutions, I guess you could say, for how do we go about protesting now that most protests, uh, you know, like the marches, the mass marches, he was part, he, he his whole life has been protesting since grade school, you know, so he's... He's been doing this forever. And he was part of when he was in school. By the way, he's our age. When he was in school, you know, like you would have been in school at the time. And he was part of the anti-war movement and all that kind of stuff. And did the marches in 2003 and, you know, that kind of. And he he, he thinks all that kind of stuff just doesn't work. You know, it's, it's uh, wrote, the problem is, in addition, is that the authorities know, have strategies to deal with it. And, you know, the protesters more or less often go along with that. So, you know, authorities have 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 a, you know, like they always put out a statement in the beginning, like everyone be peaceful and safe and all that kind of we care. And and then once the stuff happens, they try and keep them moving down the street, you know, kind of don't let them settle in one spot. It's almost becomes like an organized parade by the city. Yeah. And they've got the cops out and they've got barricades and they're like, okay, now you walk here and now you turn left and now you go here and now everybody go home. Mm hmm. And for the most part, right, most protests in America, early 21st century, do peacefully just go like that. They do what the cops tell them to do. So then they can feel like they're accomplishing something, but they're actually just obeying what the state tells them to do anyway. Perhaps. I don't know if that's this person's well, point. Well, think about it this but way. That's, what, that's how they appear to me a lot. Think about this. What Foucault had to say about institutions... And how there are these hidden power plays in institutions. Why not then have the power of the elites be in the institution of protest as well? And that people just keep kind of like, well, I'm just going to march on down the road and hang myself up in front of the city hall and do all the things I got to do and slapped on the wrist or whatever, sprayed in the (laughs) face with mace. Well, I mean, that's the idea to me. Like, that's how... All of these systems work. That's how capitalism continues to sustain itself and what we call democracy. You need to just 
In order to control, the best way to do it is to install software in people's brains so that they just do, they become robots and do what you want them to do in the first place. You don't even have to control them because they control themselves. That's what conscious, consciences are. That's what morality is. That's what perhaps this protest, you know, that's what fast food is. That's what much of pornography is. It's all just, we're going to give you something to titillate you just right and in the right way and so that we can profit off of it while controlling you at the same time. So, of course, the state is going to attempt to make the institution of protesting itself be sanitized and controlled and, and state-run state run protests. Yep. So, his... A few things that he talked about that I'm going to highlight a bit is I, I almost kind of wanted to say that he should have called this book Protesting Fast and Slow because <laughs> that's kind of the idea I think is sort of where he's going. So the next analogy that I liked that he used, which is one that you, of course, and I have talked about with various people that we know and have these kind of conversations with – is the notion of like a difference in how you perceive a frame rate. So, you know, birds might see a movie as, you know, frames going by or maybe see the strobe effect of each, you know, frame as it passes through, but we see a continuous stream, right? So his thinking is take advantage of that because the authorities aren't going to move nearly as quickly as we are. We have the ability to interact on the internet, have our deep web, Reddit, whatever, our networks, we should be able to interact and move quicker than them. So let's take advantage of that and never allow for them to hold on to us for very long before we've quickly changed our strategy. Another analogy one person could use, and I think I've even used this before in our episodes, I don't know what one, but like, you know, when the Borg is arriving and they're like, change the shield frequency to random or so they yeah. don't like you know so just like stay ahead of the game you know and i like that he has a whole bunch of different so when i hear that one the first thought that comes to my mind is to go all alex jones jesse ventura on it and say well that depends on if the powers that be are the ones that you see on c-span or if they are the ones in, on the sixth le basement level of the Pentagon or whatever. Because it could be that the things that you think are the power structures are themselves just a veneer to distract you and whatever, and that the people that are really in control of things are way faster than you guys. That to me seems possible. Sure. I'm not, I wouldn't like stand behind it or argue for it. But, right. it, you know, you might be under the illusion that you're a step ahead, but the thing that you're a step ahead of is a mask. And then the, the people really in control are a step ahead of you, using that as another trick on you. The only thing... Tinfoil hats? Okay, carry on. Well, the only thing I would say to that is the, the issue is that... In order for the state to mobilize, it has to transfer its resources. It has a lot of, it's a bureaucracy, a lot of administrators, a lot of paperwork, a lot of power struggles in and of itself. So it, re it relies on various factors that would become more predictable. And that is kind of what it would prefer to do because it needs a handbook on how to deal with protesters or whatever. Because not everyone who works for the state is going to be able to mobilize in the same way as those people who are specific enough that they come to the table together to protest. Those people are like they're in it to win it. But there's the fire department, there's the cops, there's, you know, general, you know, uh, paperwork flow to make the state run relatively smoothly. Of course, you've got whatever the responsibilities and chores are that those in in power or positions of power like mayors and governors and presidents and all, you know, and all the cabinet members that they have, like to get the state to move quickly, you know. So one of the things that I think started to happen in Portland was the mayor, fucking Wheeler, I think. Um, am I right about that? I'm like, I don't care about politics. Anyway, he decided to have this sort of hands-off approach 
to protesters and just let the Patriot people and Antifa and Proud Boys or whatever kind of figure it out on their own out there. And in a way, that might be because... Well, I, and now this is conspiratorial shit. Anyway, <laughs> well, you got it in me. You got the little meme in me. Do like, it. The state, Go there. The state got them fucking, pro, you know, proud boys to disrupt the protesters. They're like, hey, we know that they're going to move faster than us. Let's just support these crazies. <laughs> You know, and they'll show up and do the work for us, and we won't have to, like, deal with police resources to... Anyway, I'm a conspiracy Mm -hmm. nut now. You know, so get the the alt-writers and whatnot to to go out there and harass and and put it out there beforehand that we're not going to do anything. You know, like, we're just going to, you know, know, we're just going to let you guys do your thing. But there was that point when the... Protesters, I don't know if they were Antifa or whatever, but they were like directing traffic downtown in Portland and everyone was mad. And one guy was like caught on film, like, I don't know, yelling at some woman and he got fired <laughs> you know, from his job because he, he just was caught up in the moment or people are so angry right now. So anyway, so there's, there's all that craziness. But there's also, he talks about um, going rural. He's had this meme he tried to get out there called The Revolution Will Be Rural or whatever. And I think... Oh, yeah? Now I'm listening. <laughs> this is me trying to do... I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm not off script, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not calling on anything at the moment right now from the books and stuff. But essentially, you know, part of it is what makes a community in a rural environment uh, different than a urban one is that the urban one can be much more disconnected and the communities in rural environments can be more connected for various reasons. One of those he cites or talks about is that nature is kind of unpredictable, you know, and there's some spots in rural the world, the rural parts of the world that might be better to start revolutions than others and that we should go make ourselves amenable to, you know, uh, the the people uh, in these communities and become part of the communities and then slowly start to infiltrate the governments and things like that. Get people on our side and then start to change the rural landscape with respect to the basic views and, the you know, the, the attempt to get at a revolution when that moment arises or whatever. And not be, you know, and have them on your side um anyway that was another part that he was also talking about and especially when it comes to voting and when it comes i i would think when it comes to gerrymandering etc he uh, after occupy had taken off he and his wife moved from berkeley up to nehalem oregon and i guess you know he was living there when we were all here and i i remember going to nehalem falls campground a lot you know and and also there's this big nehalem bay uh campground but it's really just for people's big ass fucking rvs to plug in and all that anyway so i found that kind of interesting he ran for mayor and got like 20 percent of the vote and the incumbent of course got 80 percent and pretty much for the most part out of it he got like racist responses from people and death threats and things like that because his dad's black and his mom's white or you know they care about that in rural oregon so anyway those things were sort of the stuff that i recall but the other one and this is the one that you had mentioned it already with the you know infiltrating this the institution of protest he talks about horizontalism which I think, you know, was was something that occurred with at least Occupy Wall Street. And I'm going to quote horizontalism, quote, turns the memes into leaders and unites the people behind a voluntary shared vision. And I heard turns the memes into leaders and thought, whoa, no, like 
Fuck. I mean, I figure you probably already say that the memes are the leaders in some sense, but shit. I, I, that shook me as well. Cause I was like, turns the memes into leaders. Yeah. Because earlier <laughs> I was listening to him talk to Douglas Rushkoff, media theorist guy. And he was talking on his program, team human podcast that the left is losing its activism. You know, you know, it's, it's, it's sense of activism and revolution and whatnot to the right. You know, Proud Boys, etc. But he also was thinking about it in terms of like ISIS. He mentioned them and just sort of more conservatives taking on this idea of protest and, uh, you know, revolution and trying to get themselves to wherever it is they think the world ought to go. And I'm thinking, well, fuck, isn't Allah Akbar a meme leading the people to an extent i mean don't people adopt these memes and then do crazy things horrible things you know like uh, i uh i mean i i didn't know what to think uh, this uh self reflexively is to me an example of it because apparently the phrase make the memes the leaders or something like that impacted you significantly well, at the same time, you were like, well, you, yeah, you've probably said that before. Or whatever. And to me, I'm like, yeah, obvious. Like, that's been one of my major messages. I totally buy that. I think that for the most part, most human beings are led by the memes rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. But apparently, throughout the years, while I've attempted to express that message, it hasn't had the, quite the same impact on you as this particular meme as this phrasing of that of the, an analogous or the same idea and that one really like you know rang your bell or whatever you were like oh fuck yeah well i think primarily because this guy's of a particular bent he's of a particular like i'm getting to hear firsthand from someone more or less in those trenches i i always you know you and i are doddlers this guy's a hustler He's a doer. He's a go out there and get him. He's been protesting his whole life since grade school. And I was thinking, but, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I'm not, all I'm trying to say is that, like, I can understand. And I always got the message about when it came to, like, people whose um, fervor for ideas led them to violence and to do, commit horrible acts against people who are more or less just innocent in order to get their way, you know, terrorism, basically. But this seems like, it just seems like he's really open-armed. Like, I expected not to hear that from him, you know? Like, I expected to hear a more sober or sensible or measured idea <laughs> about these things rather than, just handing it over to the memes like well perhaps your evaluation is mistaken and that indeed is a sober and responsible opinion yeah maybe i just think that then it's just a war of memes at this, that point and then you've really just given it over and i guess i'm under the illusion that yeah it's a fucking war of memes yeah but it's a war of memes like my thinking is that just like revolutions, you may have memes, but they don't lead to craziness, you know, or whatever. And well, you, may, you may be more inclined, if you have any doubts at all, which I would like to think that people would have some, probably some more than others, <clears throat> but that you don't doubt your memes, that you don't have any kind of reservations about them. And that you were so unreserved about your memes that you let them be the leaders. That's different than just poetically saying that the memes are the leaders in the sense that, I mean, I don't mean to say just poetically, but like that the ideas, I think, kind of flit, that there's a competition of memes within you, but that at some point you say, oh, fuck it. 
I'm not going to let the competition be within me anymore. I'm just going to let this one have its way. That's, I think, what it sounds like when he says, let the memes lead. Is saying, oh, you know, he's advocating that, huh? I think so. Interesting. Because what I was about to say was that the way, at least what I mean by that phrase, that the memes are the leaders, I think that that's the primary thread that ties Robert Anton Wilson, Terrence McKenna, and I together is that we think that's a tendency that happens, but we all want to be pacifists in the war of ideas. And we don't want to go to war for an idea. We think that there's a tendency in humanity to let the ideas be the leaders and to go to war for them. But that that is something to be lamented and avoided and resisted. Right. So if this person is actively saying, let this be the case, not only is it, but let it be so, that doesn't surprise me, but then I would oppose them because I don't think that's wise. Here's, it's already been established, and I got this primarily from his work, the proportional analogy. That protests are to battles as socio-political movements are to wars. Like, the analogy has already been set up. Now let the memes be the leaders. In that sense, it's only about, in a way, conflict, power struggle, fighting it out. You know? Like, that's, that's what all of this is about. It's, it's, it may not always be a violent fight, but it can be quite a bit of a struggle. You know, it could be a tremendous amount of anguish in the process towards whatever resolution occurs. But it's already that, there. It's already there, I think. That the, in this arena, memes being the leaders is about fighting it, to me. It's not about, uh, you know like what you were talking about being a pacifist and lamenting <laughs> the thing, you know, it's, I think it's hardcore. Yeah. And that fits, that squares with your earlier suspicions about the rhetoric of this person's writing, that they were in the upper right quadrant of ideational historical process mm-hmm. movement, because that's what I think this opinion would be to let the memes be the leaders. Mm-hmm. It's a non-material thing. It's the idea. It's the information. It's the memes. And it's non-individualistic because it's subjugate yourself to it. Yes. So that that's a total upper right mantra. Let the memes be the leaders. Yes. Exactly. So. Now. Like, where do I go from here? Uh, yeah, I'm like, okay, we still got some time here. I'm just trying to... Oh, are we totally off your your program now? No, no. We, I've, like, I'm trying to figure out if this is the end of the first half or if I just keep moving, you know what I mean? Well, I reckon that's up to you. I guess we got to resolve this. Let's not, you know what I mean? We can't. <laughs> okay, we can't, sure, yeah, not press a, on. To be continued cliffhanger bullshit. Okay. So, I guess now what I want to do is start to, so there's that. This, and this comes from somebody, you know, with all that work on from Michael White, I, I, again, I liked the book. I, you know, like from a, the standpoint of, of reading a book about this stuff, I thought, okay, like I, he has, he said what he said. I don't feel like I'm way off in, like, I'm like, ah, what is he saying? You know, like, there's none of that, you know? So we're good there, I feel like. And I, I genuinely like him. Um, I, I think he's a, 
you know, uh, I think we could convince <laughs> to not let the memes be the leaders. I don't, I don't know if that would uh, work. I guess maybe we couldn't, but we definitely, for the moment, we would. He'd be like, yeah, I see what you guys are saying. I think. Uh-huh. I think. I don't know. Anyway. But I want to kind of now pivot to structuralism, you know, because I think that's essentially where I think most of the sanity is going to come from, in my opinion. And so I'm a big influence on this Peter Turchin guy that I've talked about before with the um, secular cycles and all that, the cleodynamics. He comes up in every episode now. Well, I'm just sort of in a phase of writing. <laughs> <laughs> I totally am. As soon as I'm done with that section, it'll be gone. And I'll be like, huh, I don't want to talk about people anymore. But he's just, yeah, it's, 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 this is all like, it should be clear by now that these are some of the things that I'm like, you know, hustling past the graveyard and this one, you know, just, it's, uh, it's something I've been doing a lot of, dealing a lot of, yeah, it's our podcast. We do what we want. Anyway. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. So anyway, so a big guy, a guy who's been highly influential on him is this guy, Jack Goldstone, who's a, you know, social scientist, historian guy. And he is, uh, if you want to call it a structuralist who has talked quite a bit or has, has developed quite a bit of work, you know, quite a bit of quantitative work, but also theoretical work on the idea of, you know, revolutions and rebellions is primarily worked in, uh, as I understand it, you know, like the 1600s and 1700s and the things that happened during that period of time. I think that in a, in a way is one of his, you know, you know, specialties, if you will. Um, but then of course he always naturally applies it to things that are happening today. And so, from 1991 uh, to 2014, and I don't know about now, but there were 25 revolutions in 24 years. So the idea is that we are in an era of evolution, a revolution. We're always in an era of revolution. And then, of course, there were numerous other protests all over the world. So we are living in this age, this new age of revolutions. But that there's some interesting stuff. Like, so this guy in particular, Jack Goldstone, he's one of those people who is mentioned even in this, the Michael White's book, The End of Protest, because, you know, he's done a lot of, you know, statistics and stuff like that on, on, on various uh, phenomena that people are trying to get a, a sense for. And he's reevaluated other people's analyses, given new data and all that kind of stuff. But I guess I just want to say that I don't know if I talked to you about this or not before, so this might be all new. I did type it at one point to you, but I have no idea if you really, you know, it, it, it hit home with you or not. But this, I'm calling it median age theory of revolutions or whatever, because no one has a name for this shit. And I'm like, well, how am I going to talk about this? Anyway, the idea of me. Yeah, I don't read what you type. You give it to me now. Okay, I'll give it to you now. All right, so median age theory is essentially this. Societies with a median age younger than 25 tend to have, when there are uh, sociopolitical protests and movements attempting to transition the society to democracy, those tend to be quite violent. And... The societies with a median age over 35 are peaceful transitions to democracy when there's a sociopolitical movement and revolution. Problem with the median age under 25 societies is that what often happens is quite a bit of disarray following the overthrow of whatever whoever's in power. And what typically happens is no one really has a solution at that point as to how to then begin this democracy. And what typically happens is an authoritarian swoops in. And then sometimes things are even worse than they were before the revolution. So it's just quite miserable. And 
it tends to be more successful on the other end with the th- over 35, median age over 35. Tunisia, who I was to protest the issue there that I was talking about, their median age in that that country was over 35, and they they had a peaceful transition to democracy, whereas like Egypt and other places have not had that uh, in the Arab Spring. I think the majority of countries in the Arab that participate in the Arab Spring dem- democracy movement, if you will, were under 25, and they um, you know the median age was under 25, and they totally have not done well since. And that's kind of cool, he says, because we can make predictions, at least using social science. And um, this guy, uh, Richard Chincada, I don't know how to say his last name, he predicted Tunisia would be a peaceful transition in in like 2009 and in 2010 or whatever it was. Based mostly on just the age of the population, is that what you're saying? Yep. Yep. This kind of goes back to that initial article I sent you by Douglas Rushkoff about how you know if he put out in median uh where he was like fucking zuckerberg should have stayed in school or whatever because you know it is a younger than 25 that's a you're still young you're still as he was talking about like myelin sheaths are still forming in your brain you know like like your impulsiveness at a younger age is much greater than at an older age and so in a way that kind of makes sense just developmentally and in addition to that, there are what is known in social science as youth bulges. And youth bulges will drop that median age. And so we have in the United States, baby booms. You know, the baby boom is the generation that, you know, what you know what happened towards the time that those people were starting to reach, you know, uh, their 20s and going to school. Well, they were learning things and got fed up. And of course, the cycle was happening there but the youth bulge was coincidental with the you know various you know revolutional revolutionary ideas and of you know civil rights and so on and so forth anti-war movement on and on and then um recently with occupy and all of these this youth bulge is the millennials so the millennials are another youth bulge and their parents happen to be for the mo- most part, uh, baby boomers who are also a youth bulge. So, you know, abundance begets abundance, I guess. So there's that. And in a lot of ways, um, these kinds of youth bulges are sort of also an additional predictive quality or a, a, a measure for you to kind of say, okay, well, if things are getting tight by the time this generation's coming around to their early 20s or whatever, you can imagine that there might be more social unrest. And so then he talks about, well, like, well, hey, he's, well, he talks about Russia and China. And Russia is well past 35 as a median age. So if they ever transition to democracy, the prediction would be that it would be a peaceful one. And then China just passed that, apparently, a couple of years back. So then they might, and their, you know, an economy is in a big boom right now. Um, speaking of China and the last episode was Zizek and he was talking about how, how, how can they be a, a communistic country with a, you know, booming, you know, uh, capitalistic economy? Well, if they just want to make a transition to democracy, it might work for them. But then, and this part kind of breaks my heart a little bit for many reasons, but he was talking about how sub-Saharan Africa though is preparing itself for some huge youth bulges. And I guess I'll quote him at this point. He goes, Unfortunately, the theory bears less welcome tidings for much of sub-Saharan Africa. Although many states in this region have experienced significant economic growth, they have not seen the decline in population growth rates that usually accompany economic development. Sub-Saharan Africa is thus set to experience the biggest population surge and youth bulges in history. According to projections of the United Nations, the population of sub-Saharan Africa will grow from 962 million in 2015 to 2.1 billion in 2050 and 3.3 billion in 2080, adding roughly 1 billion people per generation. Jesus fucking Christ! That's going to be a problem. 
you know, where's your miracle God now? Anyway, sorry. That was snarky. I apologize. I think about this. You know what's over? Fucking Serengeti. Say goodbye to that shit. Bye, Lions. How are you? Goodbye, Rhinos. How are they going to survive? I, how, <laughs> you know, I mean, fucking car part incubators, man. I don't know. Like, it's, they find ways to do what they need to do. How are they surviving now? <laughs> like, I'm sure more of that. Oh, fuck. But places like uh, Nigeria is projected to go from like 180, 182 billion, million to 398 million. That's about, you know, United States at this point. Mm-hmm. And that's like 2050. And then Uganda and Tanzania, you know, they're going to go... You know, from, I don't know, uh, 40 to over 100 million and, you know, or, you know, 40 or 50 to over 100. You know, so it's like, I don't know. It's, that's a problem. So, and I guess this kind of has that effect in a way with respect to these cycles, you know, because if you have economic growth, then, you know, you can support more people. And if people are inclined to have more children or whatever, uh, then you're, you are, you might have those, those youth bulges. As it seems to me when the way that the timing works out is, you know, the growth rates, the population growth rates, that's what gets us up to that capacity. And once you're at capacity, that's when shit hits the fan, you know? And so in these cycles, I was, I don't know if I mentioned this in the hustling past the graveyard. Cause another thing that I mentioned besides Peter Turchin is my own ideas. <laughs> and it's that to me is just resource enrichment, episodic synchrony. And the, the resources are typically technological and I guess I'd say technological in the sense of the sort of the study and the application of various tools and techniques. So for instance, uh, you know, when it was, you, you had mentioned you were last time when I was talking about the cycles, you were like, yeah, what about the great depression and all that kind of stuff? And what are the things that, you know, could stop the great depression from having a huge impact on the growth starting in 1910 up to 1960 to 1970 where it peaked and then started to go back down. And now we're hitting into this trough again, where the, it's not even a decline. It feels like it's just sort of stagnation, stagflation. And I learned that I think one of the big things, one of the big tools or techniques or however you want to talk about it was the high school movement. And of course it starts in 1910 and it starts in middle America in uh, Kansas and Iowa and Nebraska is where it started at first. And kind of like Micah White's shifting, you know, uh, blocks where he's got the holes and sometimes they line up. Well, in a lot of ways, there were other technological advancements that needed to be coming along before people would buy in to this idea of sending their kids and paying as a, you know, tax or, you know, the public paying for the education for for kids at the secondary level. And there are also other things happening, like the closing of the patriciate, where you went from like, you know, Harvard and Princeton and Yale having, you know, in the you know late 1800s, early 1900s before the 1930s at least, you know, they had like, you know, they did have black people going to Harvard and they did have women going to Harvard. And they did have Catholics and Jews going to Harvard, but then they start to just kick people out without explanation, you know, and they want to cut down the number of people that aren't white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant men. And this is, you know, I think fairly well documented by historians, but not only that, they started to create country clubs and they started to create a whole host of other institutions that supported this faction of the elite and they started cutting out other people because everybody was vying for elite status because everybody was trying to be the next Andrew Carnegie 
or John D. Rockefeller or whatever. And they also tried to do, there was this great merger movement where people like J.P. Morgan tried to force all these companies to come together, pay them all off, but make it just one. Because the problem was that if you had like a locomotive company or whatever, you know, and you wanted to go from New York City to Albany, New York, you build your tracks on one side of the Hudson and then your competition would be like, oh yeah, and they built tracks on the other side. It was super inefficient. Nobody was making any money because they'd spend all of their money trying to outcompete each other. And so no no actual earnings were happening, which were impacting the economy as well. And so he thought somehow if we can do diminish the amount of competition and force everything to merge like steel and locomotives and whatnot we could we could get a handle on this competition and start to really you know improve our economy a little bit more but the thing you know that would happen is as soon as he they'd merge people would start up a new company and that would do better than the merged companies and like it was all fucked up and so they were like we just got to stop the people's ability if they are in an elite if they're aspirational elites or whatever elite wannabes we got to stop them from being able to just have at this and so that's where a lot of these other institutions like Foucault is talking about started to have the implementation of the elite power infrastructure that they wanted in there to happen and then in addition to all of that one of the things they kept also doing in the late 1800s during the Gilded Age and the 1900s was especially in the 1800s there was a quote unquote natives and they're like god damn it we want to have you know better uh working conditions cuz you know you work in steel or whatever it, the conditions could be quite dangerous but if you pay more then you have to earn more right because people have this amount of money they want to make cuz they're greedy but they also have to or take less profit right right they got to get more make more profit and that's this trap that they're in, but they also need to pay for everything and continue to make money. It's just a big project that they have. And now they've got these people saying they want more money because or they want some insurance that if they get hurt, that they're not going to be fucked and their families and all that kind of stuff. So when they start to strike, you need something that can help deal with the fact that this your your workers have strike are now picketing and whatnot. And so there's this, all these elites would come together and they tried to, and they did a successful, relatively successful job, I guess, of getting the policies in place where they could get immigration coming in strong in the late 1800s. The natives were like, no more immigrants. And they're like, oh yeah, okay. And bringing in more immigrants gave them what they call a private labor exchange so that they could be the scabs when the people were picketing and they just keep on working and fuck you. But, um, and just as a side note, the only time an air attack has ever happened on the U S soil, uh, that the United States actually performed was, was, was against picketers <laughs> or something like there's like some craziness, but the, the shit, the picketing riots would be crazy and explosions and shit. Just like, Nuts. Like people were really pissed off and really struggling. And, but then once you have this huge influx of immigrants into the country, they start to say, Hey, what about us? And that's where you have like the, you know, Eastern European socialists and the Bolsheviks. And, the, and this is the early 1900s, you know, and the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Italian anarchists who were crazy. They had, I mean, they had essentially, you know, the same style of attacks as the 9-11 attacks. You know, they, they would, you know, bomb things simultaneously and kill people. And it didn't matter if they were innocent or, you know, like, you know, and, and other groups bombed, you know, so Wall Street got bombed and LA Times got bombed and all kinds of things. People, uh, there was this one guy who also went and, well, I won't even get into it. But so one of the things that 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 they did in these communities was they wanted to be able to outcompete immigrants by in, in this is in part by being able to have a higher degree of education and in these communities. And in addition to all of that, they were also anticipating the more clerical style work that was going to come along with the new kinds of, 
you know, uh, manufacturing demands that were going, being put into place, you know, in the early 20th century and all of the, you know, not just the, you didn't just have the, the industrial revolution with the cotton gin, but then you had like, you know, the steel and, and, um, you know, all the various locomotive networks, you had vehicles starting to come into play. You have all these things and they require networks and they require a lot of, you know, uh, paperwork and a lot of, uh, organization. And so if you got a degree in high school, uh, where you could learn physics and get the instruments and, you know, you know, figure out how to do, you know, math at a higher level and all that, you could go into the workforce. And so that was the part that got the economy growing. And despite the depression, despite all that, also there was the new deal. There are all these factors that came into play, but the idea that you just have this age group that never really got educated before on the level that they were getting educated and the numbers they were getting educated, which is shit, just shit fucking going right into the workforce and just exploding the economy. And that's where you get this peak by the sixties. But if you think about it, the type of work that someone was doing in 1960 versus what they would probably be doing in the same station in life, more or less in in 1880 was completely different, you know? You got madmen versus fucking like, I don't know, like, you know, the gangs in New York. You know, like it's just totally different, you know, world all of a sudden. But at that point in time, people started to say, what about us? Like, you know, there were, you know, lynchings were happening and, uh, you know, blacks were treated poorly. Women were treated as secondary citizens until they got the right to vote. All these other fa- factors. I mean, a couple world wars happened. People started to say, you know, I want in on this awesome action. And that's, again, where we kind of find ourselves in these more revolutionary style moments. So here I am. I've just gone on and on and on about this stuff. And I've still got to talk about Socrates, the sunflower revolution, and how we break the cycle. We haven't even got to Socrates yet. <laughs> An hour 40 in, and we haven't got to Greece. Oh, Greece is a big part of this, I think. That's why I saved it for last. I should have brought... Okay, you want to press on into the next phase, or do you want to make your cliffhanger? Press on! I'm going to do this. I'm sorry, people. Okay. Yeah, throw throw more stuff at us. Edumacate us. Give us your statist propaganda. Oh, yeah. Disguised as... I know. Independent dawdler's <laughs> randomness. <laughs> Jesus. So, in Plato's sixth book of the Republic, there's a discussion between Socrates and Ademantus. I don't know. How do you say his name? You're the philosopher. Adamantes? I don't know. I don't know. Adamantes. Anamantis. I don't know. Something like that. It sounds like a Wolverine Marvel comic. <laughs> yeah, Adamantium man. <laughs> it's A-D-E-I-M-A-N-T-U-S. All philosophers who know this are wrong. Oh, yeah. Out. That's not ease then. No. Anyway. Whatever. The guy's irrelevant. He is just a foil. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they're going on about democracy and the role of the citizen in democracy and, you know, who who votes and 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 is it a good thing for everybody just to get a get a vote, you know, and there were other reasons, but I'm forgetting the guy's name, but he was basically the Donald Trump of the fucking of Greece at one point, you know. I want to say like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to quote, I guess I'm quoting a translation, of course, all these translations, but then it's a quote of, from the Plato book of the Republic, and it's something that Socrates is saying. And it's a kind of a big block, and I'm just taking this sort of a latter half. And in this quote, Socrates is trying to tell Edamantus or whatever, it sounds like Adam Ant us. Adam Antus. <laughs> trying to tell him about 
like he's trying to use an analogy or an allegory, whatever, as he usually does, about uh, steering a ship and all the people on it, right? Here goes. Him who is their partisan and cleverly aids them in their plot for getting the ship out of the captain's hands into their own, whether by force or persuasion, they compliment with the name of sailor, pilot, able seaman, and abuse the other sort of man whom they call a good for nothing. But that the true pilot must pay attention to the year and seasons and sky and stars and winds and whatever else belongs to his art, if he intends to be really qualified for the command of a ship, and that he must and will be the steerer, whether other people like or not, the possibility of this union of authority with the steerer's art has never seriously entered into their thoughts or been made part of their calling. Now in vessels which are in a state of mutiny, and by sailors who are mutineers, how will the true pilot be regarded? Will he not be called by them a praetor, a stargazer, a good-for-nothing? The idea is that everybody's shake, trying to grab at the wheel and just, I want to steer it now. And everybody wants to be able to have their voice heard. But sh- are they even qualified to steer this ship? Are they qualified to vote? What is it that they've earned in, in being able to just, just to be able to just vote because you're, it's a birthright or whatever. Now it's not that I don't think that Socrates is saying that only a few people should because uh, they're special or whatever, because Socrates is scooping, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Herbert Spencer and eugenics and shit like that. He's just saying you ought to learn how to do it, just like you ought to learn how to steer a ship. Like you can't just go to the wheel and just grab at it. But... You know, with this idea of a flat hierarchy and letting the memes be the leaders, that seems like that's exactly what some people want. And yet here, I don't know, 300 BC or whatever it is, 400 BC, you got this guy talking about this. Like, I feel like we're still in the same fucking places we've always been. Democracy, if it goes, you know, if we're going to say it's going back to this point, it's like not much has changed. If people want to just be able to say, oh yeah, we're going to have a flat hierarchy and the memes will be the leaders and everybody gets a vote and everybody gets a chance and everybody gets blah, 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 blah. So I just thought that that was worth at least mentioning because of course later, you know, the famous story about him drinking the hemlock because he was <laughs> it was voted that he would be punished by death. And of course, who knows if those people were you know, educated enough to vote or whatever. But I just kind of want to throw that in there because I think that's kind of also relevant to all of this so far is like, you know, what, what is a democracy supposed to be? And is it a free for all egalitarian birthright? Or is it something that we have a, a responsibility to justify that we can partake and participate in this thing Because otherwise, if we don't, then it's possible that we can get easily swayed by those memes and do things that, you know, are are more harmful to the project than than anything else. Have I lost you? What I was hearing this time, when you go through that paragraph, that quote, from the Republic, is a tripartite distinction between, I don't know what would be the optimal terms. There's a fair amount of bourbon playing in this evening (laughs) by this point. But let's call them the aristocrats, the experts, and the proletariat or whatever, the people, Mm -hmm. the masses. That there's a problem for any one who wants to step in to a situation as it is, look at it and try to evaluate and figure out what to do now. Because right at the outset, you've got 
an established hierarchy. There is someone with the title of captain, and then there's the rest of the crew on the ship, and then there's the kind of pseudo-idealistic category of the expert, of those who, were they to be in charge of steering the ship, would utilize the best science of the times to pilot it properly. And the socio-political problem is how to get from the initial state of the crew and the captain to the meritocratic state where the experts are the pilots. Because I think that everyone or most people would agree that that were the ideal. Yes. But it's really hard to figure out how to get there. Yes. What I hear that subsection of Plato pointing out is, democracy is one example of a solution to the problem. We could just let the crew pick who pilots. But he's saying, he's, I at least hear him attempting to point out flaws in that proposed solution. Because crew members, most of whom by definition are not experts, in a sort of Dunning-Kruger manner, mm. mm -hmm. probably don't know who the experts are because they're not experts. And they are unlikely to select were it just left up to a vote, every one man, one vote, mm -hmm. they probably won't pick the best pilot either. We don't want to trust whoever is captain now because their daddy was a captain. Or who, you know. However, the etiology of the current status quo came about. We don't want to trust that, but we don't want to trust the people either because they don't know shit. And we're left with this really difficult problem of how to get from current state to ideal state because democracy seems like a flawed proposal. I don't know if that's a faithful reading, but that's what I hear in it. Yeah, and I think, but the thing is, is that ideally you could get a, get to a point where everybody, where we have a system upon which people come up and they learn about democracy and how to vote. And if they don't want to learn about it, then it becomes difficult to give them the opportunity to do, just do it whenever they want to. Because, again, uh, you know, I want to show my kid how to cut an onion. Uh, and he says, I don't really want to learn. And then at one point, he suddenly wants to cut an onion, and he refuses to let me help him. And he's cutting himself, and it's like a big dramatic problem. You know, it's like you just want to... It's not that I'm trying to have dominion over him. I just don't want this to be a fucking cluster, you know, like, <laughs> and wouldn't it be better if you, you know, if we just instead, when you are ready to learn how to do this, that we just figure out how to do it. Not everybody wants to learn how to drive a car right away. It's not a birthright that you get to just drive a car whenever the fuck you want if you haven't learned how to drive and done all the little things that one does in the driver's ed to do it. But when it comes to voting, all you have to do is be a certain age and it's, it's, you're ready, you know, and we get outcomes like Brexit and we get outcomes like Trump or this guy in ancient Greece. So I, I kind of, then I'm, I'm, I'm where I'm steering us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> where I'm steering us mutineers is towards something that I'm not sure at this point if it's a solution, if it's a good way to do it. I don't know. But it's sort of a, it's another revolution. And then I, I kind of want to talk about just, I'll briefly, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things afterwards, maybe, and then leave it to the floor. Anyway. Um, so there's this book by this guy, Chris Miller. I don't remember now. I think his name was Chris. Hi, Chris. Mr. Miller. Anyway, called The Death of the Gods. It's a new one. And in this book, uh, he highlights one area uh, of, of, you know, I guess you could say just, you know, what we're talking about, where there's 
there's there's revolution um, or protest that leads to a, an overthrow of the government in an interesting way, and then there's those people who are the overthrowers. Interestingly enough, have skills to enact a new way to do the democracy stuff. And it's not so far ended in misery. I don't know what the median age of Taiwan is, but it took place in Taiwan. And it was called the Sunflower Revolution. And I don't know why it was called the Sunflower Revolution, but everyone just sort of stood there with sunflowers. But what led up to this revolution or uh, revolt is that there was this trade agreement that Taiwan was going to have with China. And people felt like that, uh, some people at least, felt like it was kind of potentially laying the groundwork for China to just come in and, and start taking over Taiwan. And, you know, I guess that's probably what China would like. In Taiwan, which has gained its, you know, they, the, it was under British rule for a long time, and then it transitioned to sort of a independence, I think. But in any case, the government understood that there was a little bit of uh, concern about this, and so they they were like, "Yeah, we'll we'll have a we'll we'll bring it to the parliament, and we'll on the floor of the parliament, and we'll go line by line with this particular trade agreement that is on the table." And uh, we'll we'll take a while. We'll take our time with it, and we'll really come to a you know conclusion. You know, hopefully that everybody likes or whatever. But the party in power, which uh, I guess uh, the Kuomintag party, they were like fuck it, and they just were like everybody come to the parliament today. We're voting now. We're not going to do a line by line review. Like no, and so. People were stunned by that, a lot of people. And so they started this, this protest movement. And it was made, of course, of, of, of you know, people who were activists, but also you know, academics, etc. And they just, it just seemed like they were just being shut out of a whole process. And it was about something they didn't like anyway. And so what ended up happening was people stormed the parliament. They like jumped and broke the fence and jumped over it or whatever and charged into the building. They broke into the, the windows and they literally like broke into the, and occupied the parliament itself. And they were also throughout the rest of, you know, the, the main floor of the parliament where, you know, the legislative component where people were going to be talking and deciding things, but also, you know, they were just all in and around the building and they had like a sit-in or whatever. And immediately, a lot of the people who had started this sort of process of trying to, because there were other things that had happened earlier, this something called an economic power-up plan that insulted everybody. And and the government was not sure what to do about that. So it it, it invited people to... Not it, they didn't literally invite. It just it's, it incited it, you know, in people like we got to do something. And so they started to create more of their underground movements and stuff like that. One in particular, they called gov zero or zero yeah, gov zero, or if they just said gov, which was with a zero in the middle. And it's a term in particular, a lot of them were um, programmers and they used, they wanted to, what they wanted to do was, it was a term, I guess, from, uh, programming and whatnot is they wanted to fork the government they want to like start over and go in a different direction entirely and so that was their big plan or whatever so this became an opportunity for them to just bring in the cables and start streaming live the sit-in and the you know the activities that were happening in the sort of legislative hall of the the parliament and just started streaming it on youtube and that allowed them some leverage all of a sudden to, uh, you know, kind of maintain their position in that part because otherwise the cops and, and riot people came and there was some battling going on between the protesters and the, the police and whatnot, but the police ended up fighting them back, but they didn't want to go in and have a, like a bloody 
uh, takeover of the main legislative floor uh, where people were having a sit-in because it was being streamed live on YouTube. And the only way they were able to do that was if they got in there, apparently. And so uh, there was a stalemate, and they just decided they weren't going to vote. And that was what allowed the protesters to say that they would leave or whatever. But then all of a sudden, the government had this like crisis of uh, legitimacy or whatever. And so they couldn't... They couldn't ask people much after that, it seemed. And so they aligned themselves with these more, these activists. And the activists were like, okay. And then they became part of the government and started moving up the ladder in their own right, becoming without any kind of portfolio or whatever, like, you know, municipal ministers and things like that. This one particular person, uh, this transgender uh, genius, if you will, protege, type person, uh, Audrey Tang became the digital minister of Taiwan and stuff. Eventually they were, they were, they, they set up all these programs to let people be able to be, they just wanted to make the government more transparent. And so they, they did that. And that, that allowed for people to, you know, follow the stocks and, and, and trade and all the various kinds of, uh, activities that the government was uh you know performing but it was all you could just watch all of it happen and there was no behind the curtain aspect that there was prior and eventually they didn't know like how they were going to really be able to install this one program that they had um which was called um well for instance they had this one program called V Taiwan uh, which is Vote Taiwan, because they wanted to install a program that they had called Polis. And anyway, all it really did was, is it was a, a program that had been created to try and produce um, consensus, and but in a voting manner. And one of the people in particular, this guy Colin Megill or whatever, he was he was part of the Occupy movement or whatever. And he had been thinking about how, how do we create a consensus or whatever? And so when Uber came to town and wanted to start installing itself in, you know, type a city and stuff like that, they found this as a, an opportunity because of course, what was happening across the planet, you know, when Uber would show up in Paris or wherever there'd be the, the taxi drivers would riot and everybody would be super pissed and all that kind of stuff. And so they thought this would be a good opportunity to show what, you know, a potential consensus making software program could could do. And so they essentially had uh, these different stages that you would go through when you participated in V Taiwan. And the first stage was just like giving people facts, you know, like as if they just went to Wikipedia or whatever, and they just learned about what was going on in a more plain language, non-legalese kind of way. And then the next phase of it was that then people could kind of share their thoughts and feelings about the situation. And so finally, what they did was they people would then go to this particular program, this software program on the web, and they'd log into this site. And what would happen is it'd be like this white screen and then a statement. And the statement, first single statement that they got was this. I think passenger liability insurance should be mandatory for riders on Uber X private vehicles. And then they would either have to say they agree, disagree, or pass. Once they did that, then they could immediately start to see where they are in a distribution of agree, disagree, pass, whatever. And so then from there, they were like, okay, now draft your own statement with... My feeling is... And then draft a statement. You draft that statement, you put it out there, and then other people can agree, disagree, or pass on your statement, and you can do that with theirs. And so over time, they started to have this, you know, everybody's just sort of making statements and agreeing and disagreeing, and then it clusters up. And at the end of that part, they got about four different groups... Uh, so it was taxi drivers, Uber drivers, pro or Uber passengers, and other passengers. It was kind of this basic kind of groupings that emerged. And then from there, uh, you know, they were able to slowly start to build, you know, they just kept, you know, agreeing or disagreeing with all these basic statements. 
that were being made and they ended up getting two groups at the end. And then they asked the two groups to, because the, each two groups had a statement that they had a majority that they agreed with. And the two, two groups kind of were like pro Uber pro taxi, but they weren't really opposite statements. They it wasn't complimentary. It was just sort of, they were kind of, they didn't really intersect in any kind of square angle type of way. Anyway, what ended up happening was they asked them to kind of like add some nuance to what it is that they're saying, you know, be, be a little bit more verbose and, and think about what it is you want to say. And so everybody put out, out there trying to modify and they agreed and disagreed and all that kind of stuff. They ended up coming out in the end with an actual consensus statement that emerged that 95% of the people agreed with when they were given the choice with the statement. And so the statement was the government should leverage this opportunity to challenge the taxi industry to improve their management and quality control systems so that drivers and riders would enjoy the same quality service as Uber. So now they had some success with this particular uh, process. And anyway, depending on what you want to call it, when, when you go through this, I'm like, I think the, Appropriate name for that thing would be the banality detector. But all right, anyway. <laughs> the idea, though, is that trying to form some kind of consensus through people participating, and they're not... It's like you 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 decide through citizen participation what the issue will be before, you know, having a baked-in-the-cake kind of you know, thing that you then have to decide on. So it was kind of the inverse or, you know, kind of a bottom up approach. And I just am thinking, okay, well, and now they kind of want to try and do this type of thing with lots of other issues. Um, apparently it's broken like other kinds of deadlocks, you know, that were political ones like on alcohol and, you know, how to sell it online or not. It's done other things. And now people in Korea want to start applying it. And the new, you know, prime minister or whatever of Taiwan was like, yeah, let's just start doing this with our decision making for our city and stuff. But I don't know. I mean, this is, what is this? You know, like, is this the memes leading the people? Is it, you know, it's a flat hierarchy. Nobody is privileged over another. They just agree, disagree or pass. I'm I'm just not sure where this in particular leads, and is it something that people can then adopt elsewhere? Is this a solution? Here's my main thing, and so I, I presented that because I think it's relevant. I'm not saying I presented it well or that I have any kind of period to put on it, but if societies go through these fucking cycles, if they do, is that what we want to do? Like, what if this becomes the next technological resource that makes us a boom again. And then we kind of rise up and then there's something we can't think of right now that people will be identify as being later and be like, God damn it. Where's my rights? You know? And are we just going to keep doing this over and over again? Do people really think that something like this is going to be an, uh, is going to just save the day. Is it Douglas Rushkoff's peer to peer networks in a market? you know, place that should be happening. Is it the flat hierarchy stuff like this? Is it, uh, uh, you know, public works projects where when times are good, we just put our efforts into public works projects and not just make a whole bunch of babies and gobble up all the resources. Like, what do we do? Like what, what do we want to continue to cycle through if that's what's happening? Do we not want to, how do we like break the cycle if we want? You know, and and break break it in such a way that we just keep going up, not obviously plateauing necessarily, or go down, you know, and stay down kind of thing. Like, how do you how do you just keep going up? Is that what we want? Do we want to just keep going up? I mean, I you know what I'm saying? Like, that's the thing about at the end of all of this shit. I'm just like, well, what do we want? Like, what is it that people want? I mean, utopia, schmopia, there's always going to be problems, but this seems like these cycles seem just 
ridiculous, you know? And now that you know potentially that something starts the cycle again, you know, you got the closing of the patriciate at the top and you got maybe some kind of technological resource of sorts that pushes things from the bottom, you know, would you, would you knowingly do that? No, with the idea that it's probably just going to get worse eventually, be great for a little while and then it's going to suck and it'll be hopefully great. You know, fingers crossed you, uh, the holes line and then you get to have another upswing. I, I just don't know. It sounds like a wonderful bevy of questions to leave the listeners with, to debate amongst themselves. You have it, folks. Um, yeah. Right? I mean, that's, that is a place where you, I mean, that sounds like your message or your ending place is to leave it with a set of questions, right? Hmm? This isn't a place where you want to leave it with, I suggest X. It's more just, I'd like to find a way to pose a conundrum and then ellipses. I leave the helm to the mutineers. <laughs>